Hi there, Martin McNeil here again. Um, been about two weeks now almost since the first video that I had to put up and you know quite surprised by the somewhat overwhelming response that that video had and you know, a lot of you had questions about things like fair use, fair dealing, copyright law in general and given the volume of questions that came into me I thought that it was probably a good idea to make a video where I could pull all those questions together and answer them in one go. Uh, obviously some of you may have had specific questions that I wouldn't really be touching on uh, directly but and what I'm going to say here, you should have answers to those and maybe even more questions coming to your mind on the back of what I'm planning to say. Now, I did want to make this kind of like a free-flowing monologue talking about these topics, but there's a lot of detail to go over and that requires me to be quite specific and accurate in what I'm saying because if I don't, I could end up giving you wrong or false information. And I've got some notes here on screen just off camera which I'm going to be referring to. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing because I'd rather rely on some notes and be completely accurate in what I'm saying than go waffling off on tangents and spewing out wrong information. So probably the first and most important thing is to say that I am not a lawyer, I'm not a solicitor, I'm a legal academic, I have a qualification in law in that regard, so I can impart legal advice. That's simply not possible. But what I can do is give an overview of law, how it's developed, um, what it is, what it's not, and how you know, it's interpreted through case law and so on. What I will say is that I did pass over all my notes to a good friend who's a lawyer in the United States, a specialist copyright attorney, and when they came back they didn't say that I had to <laughs> burn them all to the ground, uh, start over again or just give up. So what I'm saying here has been reviewed for accuracy and detail. Uh, so don't have any concerns and I don't have any concerns with all regard. Um, if you want to contest any of these issues, you know, if, if you disagree, by all means, leave comments and so on. But um, let's just dig into it now. OK. Uh, the first thing I wanted to touch on is the fact that copyright is in many ways a human right. It's enshrined in the text of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights as enacted on December 10th of 1948 in the Palais de Chalot in Paris, France, specifically in Article 27, which reads, Everyone has a right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And everyone has a right to protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he is the author. Now, here we see that the rights of society as a whole are held equally in balance with the rights of the artists and scientists who work to advance and enrich our lives. One of the first questions posed to me came from a UK-based YouTuber in the retro gaming community who wanted to remain anonymous, asking, are there any ways in which I can be certain that what I'm using falls within fair use? Now, as Christopher Bullock wrote in his 1716 play, The Cobbler of Preston, it is, not po <laughs> it is impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. Now, I'm not wanting to go off on a tangent, but I thought that death and taxes would be an awesome name for a rock band, and it turns out that somebody else already had that idea. And you can check out the link to their music in the description to this video. Now, getting back on track, to understand why it's not possible to be absolutely sure that artists, creators, YouTubers and so on will never be completely shielded against someone claiming that a given use of their work wasn't lawful, we must understand what fair use is and what it isn't. The first thing to keep in mind is fair use is a legal doctrine that was written into law in the United States that became part of the US statutory law back in 1976, long before the modern internet existed and it's found in Section 107, Title 17 of the United States Code. Before that time, it was a common law doctrine, and that meant it was a concept developed over time by judges and court proceedings, but not fixed in the black letter law that is created by elected representatives. Now, since I'm going to be talking mostly about US law, it'll be useful to be familiar with certain terms that are defined in this context, like audiovisual work, 
the definition in law of when a copyright work is created, derivative works, displaying works, what is meant by fixing in a tangible medium, literary works, what performing a work means, sound recordings, what transmission is, what a work of visual art is, and equally what it isn't. These definitions will be useful because understanding fair use begins with knowing what rights copyright holders have. And those rights are set out in section 106, title 17 of the US Code. And I'm going to recite those rights in order of how that section has been written. The right to authorise reproductions of their work. The right to authorise derivative works to be created. The right to authorise distribution of their work by way of sale, rental, lease or lending the right to authorise public performances of their work, the right to authorise the display of their work, and lastly, the right to authorise the performance of a sound recording by way of digital transmission. Now that we know what rights are conferred by copyright law in the United States, we can work towards knowing what fair use is and why it's frequently misunderstood. In the simplest terms, it allows for certain acts and actions to take place without the prior consent of the rights holder. And here's what text, the text of section 107, title 17 of the US Code looks like, where those exceptions to the creator's rights are written down. You'll see that there's a preamble explaining how and when fair use might apply, followed by the four factors that judges or juries use when they're asked to determine whether a use is fair or not. I'm going to look back to these factors in a moment because there's something about fair use that many people aren't aware of. It's an affirmative defence, which the Westlaw Legal Database explains as being a defence based on facts other than that which support the plaintiff or government's claim. A successful affirmative defence excuses the defendant from civil or criminal liability wholly or partly, even if all the allegations in the complaint are true. In plainer terms, the affirmative defence of fair use is when you say, yes, I admit that I infringed on this copyright, but I believe that I'm allowed to do so because, and then you set out your argument, referencing which factors individually or in combination you believe to excuse you from getting permission from the rights holder to do what you did. And you have to keep in mind that because copyright infringement is mostly a civil court matter, the burden of proving whether a use is fair or not rests with the person that used the work and not the person claiming that their copyright has been infringed. The second thing to mention is that the fair use legal defence only applies if you live or carry on business in the United States and related territories. This is not to say that the other countries don't have similar carve-outs in law, some of which are also referred to as fair use exemptions, or slightly different terms such as fair dealing. And as shown on this map, which was made in 2019 by Amy Bulgrian for the Library of Copyright Alliance, it's worth noting that this map is both three years old and doesn't exhaustively list all the countries that may have similar exceptions in law that use different terms or different standards. It should really go without saying that if you're critically concerned about whether you'll be on the receiving end of a legal claim because you regularly make use of other people's copyright material, the absolute best course of action you can take is to get qualified professional legal advice. The best time to do this is before you act. The second best time is when you think you've done something that could expose you to the risk of getting sued. There's an idiom in legal practice that goes like this. If you think it's too expensive to hire a lawyer, wait until you find about the cost of not hiring one. Of course, artists and creatives doing things as their hobby, their passion or side hustle, probably not gonna have the coin to be able to afford getting that sort of advice especially in the current economic climate. The remaining option open to you is to perform a fair use self-analysis, but if you do this, you need to be completely unbiased when doing so. With that in mind, let's now look at each fair use factor in turn, starting out with the first one, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for non-profit educational purposes. Right off the bat, we can see that this factor contains a question that you need to answer. In a recent article over at Illusion of More, writer, director and cinematographer David Newhoff discusses how to perform a fair use self-assessment on this factor. Ask yourself two questions and be very honest. Is your use commercial 
and that you may derive some marketable value from it or even promotional value? Does your new expression comment in some way upon the protected work being used? If the answer is yes to commercial and no to comment, you're already on somewhat shaky ground for a fair use defence. But what does comment mean? If you're doing the analysis yourself, be literal. Are you criticising, parodying or analysing the original work in some way rather than perhaps criticising, parodying or analysing something other than the original work? The big question here is whether the original work is doing a lot of the heavy lifting as part of the new expression you are creating. More importantly, David expands on the frequently misunderstood presence of the word educational within the context of this factor. It's often mistaken to mean any enlightening experience. As he goes on to explain, an educational use does not mean your blog that may be highly informative. It mainly refers to classroom learning. So if you are not a teacher or instructor using a work for that purpose, don't assume educational applies simply because you are conveying information. This is an important distinction because practically any artistic or creative work can be placed into a context that is informative or educational in some manner. So the law has developed to limit education exemptions to activities related to established institutions for learning. Because if you remove that limitation, the balance points that I referenced early on in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the one between society in general and the interests of artists and scientists, well, that skews massively towards the former to the detriment of the latter. One thing that David doesn't touch on here is an element of fair use that many of you may have heard about before, transformative use. And that's because this isn't written into law, but came about because the United States Supreme Court introduced the doctrine via a ruling back in 1994, arising from a case known as Campbell versus a Cuff Rose Music. Surface facts are this, the rap group Two Live Crew created a parody of Roy Orbison's 1964 song, Oh Pretty Woman, which asked a Cuff Rose sorry, which a cuff rose music held the rights to. The rappers had asked for Orbison's publishers for a license to make the parody, but Cuff refused. When the song was released and became a hit, a Cuff sued for copyright infringement. Now, as often happens when there's a lot of money on the line, the case bounced all the way up the appellate system and eventually the Supreme Court heard it on appeal and then introduced the idea of transformative use in their ruling which is when you use an existing work as a basis for one of your own, the more transformative your use of that work, the lower the significance that will be given to the remaining three fair use factors. Uh, although there's no bright line guide or threshold as to what constitutes transformative use, looking at the Supreme Court's wording in the Campbell case can help all the same. For example, if you use somebody else's photograph and simply desaturate it to become a monochrome image, the amount of transformation in the new work is arguably incredibly low and almost non-existent, especially considering that these days this level of transformation can be achieved nearly instantly by many image editing apps and software, facts that would tilt the analysis towards an unfair use. Contrary example would be where you used a photograph of a summer sunset scene in the Scottish Highlands as a reference image to create a painting on canvas of the same scene but imagining how it might look on a cool winter's day. By doing so, you've arguably used a high degree of skill to not only create a new work in a different format, but likely injected new meaning beyond the original based on your unique expression. Although this could equally mean you've created a derivative work in the process. Now, clear examples of derivative works are taking a novel and making a feature film or audiobook from it. And because the film or audiobook wouldn't exist without the original, even if there are differences present in those adaptations, anyone wanting to make that film or audiobook would need permission from the writer and would likely have to pay for that permission. Another way to know if your use is transformative or derivative is if a casual observer could identify the original source from the work you created. An example of this is photorealistic paintings or sketches. You know, these may find you back at a low level of transformation despite all the obvious skill and effort you've put into making it. Furthermore, if the purpose of making those photorealistic paintings or sketches is to sell that art or copies of it, you've likely tilted the analysis back towards an unfair use. Uh, coincidentally, the US Supreme Court heard arguments in a case relating to transformative use just a few days ago 
between photographer Lynn Goldsmith and the Andy Warhol Foundation, relating to the late Andy Warhol making use of Goldsmith's 1981 portrait photograph of Prince. But the court's decision likely won't be known until spring of 2023. Hopefully we'll all end up with a clearer definition of what transformative use is or isn't in the eyes of the law. So I may come back to this particular topic once that opinion is handed down. If you want to have a go at deciding for yourself whether Warhol's use of Goldsmith work is transformative or derivative, feel free to pause the image on screen and take some time to make up your mind. I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments section. Now, my own interpretation leans towards derivative because I see that certain elements of Goldsmith's photo appear to have been reproduced with exacting detail to a degree that suggests mechanical methods having been relied upon, such as photocopying or projection, with Warhol's additions being blocks of colour to substitute for the subtle textures in Goldsmith's portrait, along with outline of pre-existing shapes and contours. For those of you that want to read what was said during the Supreme Court arguments, I've also linked to the transcript of proceedings in the description. Now let's move on to the second factor, the nature of the work used. The question here refers to whether a work that has been used is creative or factual. Now remember, the intention of copyright is to protect artistic expression. So the law here is designed to prevent a monopoly over facts. An example being the quoting of a definition from the dictionary, which is factual in nature, versus reproducing a section from a best-selling novel, which is creative. However, this doesn't give you free reign to copy the entire dictionary, and we'll come on to why that's the case in a moment. Now, the law doesn't set out a definition of creativity itself, so there's no bar or threshold in that regard, meaning that the video you've taken of your dog rolling in the mud and then running around inside your house is afforded the same level of protection as a movie such as Jaws or A Clockwork Orange. The one thing that is agreed upon in almost everywhere is that a creative work must be the result of human authorship. So for now, AI-generated works get no copyright protection in most jurisdictions. For example, this image created by the Midjourney application uh, using the prompt law textbook stacked on a desk, uh, there's no copyright that attaches to that at all. Next up is factor three, the amount of the original work used. I'm going to quote David Newhoff's article again because he articulates this point far better than I could hope to do so. The amount used is probably the most misapplied concept. There is no set amount of an original work, like 10%, that's automatically fair use. The most important question to ask yourself here is, did you use the heart of the original work, for example, the refrain in a song, or the most prominent elements in a visual work, and did you use only as much of the original as necessary to fulfill the purpose of your new expression? So, factor three may refer back to factor one, and that question as to how much labour is the original work really doing for you within the new expression you are making? And do you really need to copy so much? Imagine removing the protected work you're using and consider how your project changes. If the honest answer is that the original work is conveying a lot of the overall expression, and you've used a lot of that work, and you're not commenting on the original, then fair use may not be on your side. On the other hand, if you can reasonably say that you are using only a portion of the original work, and especially if your expression is in some way commenting upon that original work, you're more likely protected by the fair use exception. Now, if you're using a fragment of that work, you may also be protected by the doctrine of de minimis use, lawyer for just a tiny bit, and fair use may not need to be considered. I'd like to expand on what David's notes a little bit, and as mentioned, the factor relating to the amount of work can vary depending on the type of work used. Films and television shows are lengthy. Uh, the duration of a piece of music can be brief or meanderingly long. Still images such as photographs or illustrations have no fixed durations, so the calculation of amount calls back to percentage and using the whole or significant amount of any work as opposed to a small portion of it is going to tilt this factor away from fairness. Now, to illustrate this point, I'm going to use my Ray Harryhausen photograph that most of you will be familiar with. And here's the frame as I shot it on the day, with the file from my camera being 4256 pixels tall by 2832 pixels wide. 
Uh, there's a lot of empty space around the subject which was done deliberately. Magazines or websites sometimes like to run text or other design elements on top of images themselves, especially for front page uses. So building in this empty space allows for designers to do this without impacting on an image. When the New York Times ran this photograph online, they chose to crop away this empty space and reduce the image dimensions to 2048 pixels wide by 1669 pixels tall, also changing the 2-3 aspect ratio to almost 5-4. And even so, we see that the heart of the work is still present, being Ray's overall pose alongside his creations. We could take that further and crop the NYT's use again to a 2-3 aspect ratio and zoom in further. Ray is still clearly in the heart of the image, this time with only a portion of his skeleton warrior figure from the 1963 film Jason and the Argonauts. Compared to the original frame, this crop is now 2,001 pixels high and 1,334 pixels across. That's about 22% of the original pixel count. Yet the heart of the work is still present and very recognisable. Alternatively, if you took the New York Times edit of my work and cropped it to 1920 pixels wide by 1080 pixels tall, the common display size for televisions, computer monitors, laptops and more, this is how it would look when filling the screen. I think you'll agree that the heart of the work is still clearly there. Now, if we switch to thinking about music, where you might use a short sampling of the chorus or hook of a song, although that may be a small percentage of the overall song length, it's likely to be the most identifiable element of the song itself, which will require permission and probably a payment if you want to make use of it. When we instead consider movies or TV shows, and how a few seconds of those are frequently made into gifts or memes, then we're getting into the realm of using a very small portion of the original work, which tips the scales towards fair use, in the same way as brief quotes from novels or other creative literary works are likely to be fair as well. As David says in an article, the amount used can be so small a portion of the original that there's no need for it to be argued as fair use or not, since the de minimis legal standard, just a little bit, kicks in. Uh, no, I'm not talking about Gina G's 1996 Eurodance song, and you're welcome for that, earworm. Moving swiftly on from the historical Eurovision Song Contest entries, we find ourselves now at the final factor, potential harm to the market for the original. Once again, David's blog eloquently articulates this calculus. In the simplest analysis, if those other three factors are not looking like your use is a fair use, at the very least, you're likely depriving your copyright owner of a valid opportunity to charge a fee for the use you wish to make. Considering market harm can be this simple, but more broadly, a court would ask, what would happen to the copyright owner's licensing opportunities if multiple parties were to make uses just like yours? And the key word here is potential. Whilst it can get complicated in some cases, it is often just common sense. Especially if you are a creator, ask yourself whether you could license your work for the use you intend to make. If the honest answer to that is at least maybe, then you're thinking about potential market harm in the right way, because that maybe would probably first depend on who's using it and for what purpose and how much of your work they're using. You see what I mean? As a creator, you should be at an advantage considering fair use because you can apply the thinking as if your work is being used by somebody else. Finally, on the market harm question, the argument that your use may increase the value of the protected works through exposure is not a factor in a fair use defence and is a consideration at the discretion of the copyright owner. There may be reasons other than financial why an owner will object to use and if the use is infringing, it's infringing. Remember that assessing each of the four factors individually will result in a finding of fair or not fair for that factor alone, but the importance given to each factor will depend greatly upon the very specific circumstances relating to your use of a work. You could have factors one, two, and three all tilt in your favor towards fair use, but then the potential for market harm in factor four is argued to be so great that it overrides the first three factors and results in a determination of unfair use and consequently that a copyright infringement has happened. And the opposite could be true in a case that, on the surface, is quite similar to yours, but diverges on perhaps the finest of details. 
On that point, because fair use is an affirmative defence that is open to interpretation, it's also quite possible that you could look at the facts and come away saying, I think this use is fair, whereas someone else will look at the same facts and reach the opposite conclusion, especially if you've got no grounding in the law or the cases that have developed over, over time. Scaling that thought up a little bit to the situation that nobody wants to find themselves in, the inside of a courtroom, and you could have a judge or jury making determinations who have as much familiarity with copyright law as they do open heart surgery. Or maybe they simply don't like the way you look or conduct yourself. Such biases aren't supposed to exist in legal proceedings, but if you ask any practicing lawyer or solicitor, they'll tell you it happens all the time. This is sometimes called the elusive fifth factor in copyright or fair use claims, where the pre-court and in-court conduct of the parties can influence the outcomes. On that note, I wanted to mention that a fair use self-analysis is something that a rights holder must also perform before they issue a DMCA takedown notice. You won't find that written into the statutory law because it's a precedent that came out of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit from a case known as Lens versus Universal Music, shown here on screen. If you're the sort of masochist or law nerd that enjoys reading court opinions, I've linked to the case text in the description for this video. As I've said, the obligation this case created isn't found anywhere in the text of the DMCA itself, but since many of the major platforms are headquartered in the 9th, you may see that some service providers' DMCA forms require you to check a little box that says you've already considered whether the use is fair or not. Uh, here's a map of the Ninth Circuit, and you'll see it covers quite a lot of the Western United States. If you ever need to send a DMCA takedown notice, I suggest that the best practice would be to do a fair use self-assessment regardless, even if you're dealing with a person or entity in one of the other eight federal court districts, because you'll be better placed to show that you've been reasonable if you're ever challenged about it. That idea dovetails nicely into thinking back to the opening question of, are there any ways in which I can be certain that what I am using falls within fair use? And the somewhat reductive answer gained from looking at the four factors and how they un are interpreted is, no, but you can reduce risks by being both careful in what you use and honest about whether you're exposing yourself to potential liability by using anything that you yourself didn't create. Risk mitigation is something I wanted to talk about. I'd like you to consider that artistry is about creation, not curation or collation. So the more originality you put into whatever it is you do, the less you will need to rely on the work of others. Or if your creativity has limits, you could work with other artists and seek uh, to have them contribute the things that you need, such as an animated intro for your videos, an original music track to use as a background element, and so on. If you do find yourself wanting to use the pre-existing work of other people, a simple risk mitigation strategy is to ask them for permission. After all, you are able to find their work by some method, so why not take time to go the extra mile, tell them what you'd like to do, and ask if they'd be willing to let you use their creative output as part of it. The mantra of better to beg forgiveness than ask permission may be true regarding speed of action, but it could expose you to a lot of otherwise avoidable risk. In this very video, I've used screen captures and quotations from David Newhoff's article about fair use, and I sought out and got advanced permission in writing to do so. This is as good a point as any to also state that the risk you face will differ depending on where you live, because permitted lawful acts vary from country to country. If you live in the United States, it's a combination of federal, state and local laws that limit your actions. But if, for example, you live in the United Kingdom, you'll be constrained by a different set of laws which may have similarities in some parts to US copyright law, but then diverge significantly in others. A case in point is the fair use doctrine does not exist in UK, but fair dealing does. And it's a little bit narrower in scope, and in my opinion, easier to understand for those same reasons. It might not appear that way to the casual observer because there are 73 subsections within the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988 that deal with various scenarios in which creative works may be used without the consent of a rights holder and, like US law, these are generally affirmative defences and not automatic shields. To give an example of this clarity when compared to US law, 
fair dealing for educational purposes must be non-commercial in nature and undertaken by a person giving or receiving instruction. Now, this has been interpreted as meaning a qualified teacher in a state-recognised educational establishment such as the primary school, secondary school, colleges, universities or similar, or by students in the same setting. Almost all private for-profit educational establishments would fall outside this ambit, even if they were using the same materials for an identical purpose. So if you need to perform a fair dealing self-analysis under UK law, you can have a look through the subsections and find those that might apply to your circumstances. It's most likely that one of the general exemptions found in sections 28 through to 31 could apply, but again, be honest in your assessment because these exemptions are a prescriptive list, meaning if you can't find an exemption that matches up to the way you want to use a work, you're likely committing copyright infringement if you go ahead and do so without getting consent first. If you read through any of these sections, and you might notice that one of the key differences in UK law as compared to the US is that, for a use to be fair dealing, the original author or source must be given attribution. This flows from UK copyright law having a strong moral rights provision, which is the right to be identified as the author of a work. And that's found in chapter four of the CDPA. Since it appears you've stayed with me through to this point, you might be thinking to yourself, with all that you've said, a lot of the uses of copyright material I see online every day are probably not covered by fair use or fair dealing. So why aren't we seeing more threats of legal action or people being sued? And that comes down to a unique feature of copyright. It's not a defend it or lose it right in the same way that patents and trademarks are. Rights holders can and do ignore a lot of actions that arguably infringe on their copyrights, including things like fan fiction, cosplay, and experience-oriented events that could be confused for officially endorsed ones. A common tipping point between inaction and a legal demand calls back to that first question of the fair use self-analysis. If you use someone else's work in a context that will generate an income for you, either directly or indirectly, and you've done so without advanced consent, then you're likely tripping over that line of legal liability. An example of this found in recent news comes from the hit Netflix show Bridgerton, which a songwriting duo known professionally as Barlow and Bear adapted into a musical. Variety magazine has the details on the lawsuit that Netflix brought against the pair and its eventual settlement, but the key takeaway found in their reporting is that Netflix tacitly permitted the fresh fan service spin right up until Barlow and Bear decided to start making money from their efforts when they put on a full production in the Kennedy Center in Washington DC with tickets priced up at to I think it was $149 each along with another planned for the Royal Albert Hall in London, England. Reports imply that the parties have settled the matter and the lawsuit has been dropped, and it's highly likely that the terms of the settlement are cloaked by a non-disclosure clause, which is a common practice for litigation at this level. To tie things up for now, the Bridgerton case allows me to answer the second question that was put to me. Should I delete any videos that may contain images that do not fall under fair use? Uh, taking everything I've talked about into consideration, the answer for anyone out there who's uploaded videos that make use of others' creative work is maybe. I mean, if you've done a fair use of fair dealing self-analysis and think that you might be exposed to the risk of a DMCA takedown request or copyright strike, as YouTube likes to call them, then your individual appetite for risk will govern how you'll want to act. I myself undertook a fair use and fair dealing self-analysis in creating this video. When I made the series of images that used Andy Warhol's artwork just to pose with Lynn Goldsmith's portrait, I was confident that the nature of my use and the related commentary would give me a sure footing to argue that it was a legitimate, lawful use of these materials that did not need the express permission of the rights holders, and I am prepared to defend that position if necessary. When it came to photographer Igor Kasyanuk's photograph of Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear, as reproduced in the Variety article that I've quoted, I was on a less sure footing, so I was prepared to pixelate the photograph to a point of near obscurity instead because, although I had sent a message to Mr. Kassianuk to request permission to reproduce it, I wasn't sure if he would receive a, a, a reply from him quite prior to the date of recording this video. 
Unfortunately, just after 5 a.m. on October 19th, Mr. Kasyanuk gave me express consent to include his photograph as long as it was credited to both him and his company, Verst Media. To close off, for anyone watching this, I obviously don't know your specific circumstances as artists or creators, and even if I did, I'm not a practicing lawyer or solicitor and couldn't give you legal advice. Having an academic law qualification, I can only speak to how I might act in similar situations, offer an overview of what the black letter of the law is, how cases heard in the courts have interpreted it over time, and what practices are commonly used by media professionals with respect to both of these factors. Hopefully that alone will put you in a more informed position than you were previously, and if there are any other topics or subjects that you'd like me to address in future videos, do let me know. And Thanks for watching.